Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion about data and transport modelling. Many, many people have expressed a concern about systemic problems in the processes in which transport modelling is a contributor. I believe a helpful strategy is to expand our engagement with a wide range of stakeholders over time, more than our role of being seen to produce conclusions, particularly towards the end of the process. It starts with the data we collect, why we collect it, how we use it, and how it relates to people, more than just being numbers to fit our models. We need to actively give insights that engage all participants, including the community, well before deductions are made. I had a career-forming experience in my early working life. I was in government and working with others on running a model of the whole Sydney transport network, rail and road. With some difficulties, we finally produced the first output on a Friday afternoon, but had not done any calibration, any fine tuning. But on the weekend, a press release was issued that began with the words something like, after extensive computer analysis, we have decided to build this big project. The core of our problem is that our role is seen mainly as producing conclusions towards the latter part or at the end of a long process. Furthermore, our results can be compromised by proponent demands and are often misused. Of course, we present the results in detail. List of assumptions, range of the likely outcome. But we all know that the assumptions are not going to make it into the press release. And when he was President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson asked an executive for a number that showed the impact and justified a proposed project. The executive gave him a range. LBJ is reported to have said, ranges are for cattle, give me a number. It is usually far too late, or certainly much harder, to try and convince a stakeholders, including politicians and the community, at the end of a process. And technical excellence is rarely, if ever, seen as a justification for a conclusion, unless of course it agrees with the original desired outcome, which for successful operators, this is usually the case. People cherry pick the results or ignore them and rely on obvious conclusions, the pub test. John Reed from Oz Traffic, and I note that I collaborate with him on issues to do with the profession, but not on his survey business, was the executive producer of a series of videos called Heroes of Data. One quote is from Sherlock Holmes, who said, There is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. There is a movement now that has been called data journalism. It's not just about getting headlines in a mainstream media and certainly not shouting opinions about solutions. But we first have to get the right data. We must put more focus on broader community understanding rather than concentrate on collecting for specific projects and not collect data just to quantify our existing perceptions but to discover new things. There's no such thing as typical Yet we cut back on data collection during the worst of COVID to wait until things got back to normal, whatever that means. Now, last year, David Hencher held a panel discussion in which Professor Phil Goodwin from the UK responded to this situation in academic terms. Completely daft to stop surveying <laughs> during, during but, 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 COVID. Yeah. Uh, you know, even if you're going to be completely sort of cynical and brutal and, and hard-minded about this. What a splendid social experiment to well, see how people respond to an unexpected emergency. At least one group in the UK pushed against the tide and collected data during COVID. This CIHT podcast is well worth listening to. A significant problem is measurement is dominated by how we travel, not why. In another one of John's videos for an AITBM webinar, he used comments from Liz Ampt and Michael Caltabiano. Liz Ampt's special area of expertise is household transport surveys, where you measure in detail what are the situations 
and opportunities in households that lead to the trips that are made. If you just look at patterns of people's trips, you have no idea why they're doing it and therefore you can't use any of that data really for planning. That is the direction of the future, David. I mean, behaviours, why people do what they do when they interact with a transportation system is something that we've at Arbath very focused on. We have actually got psychologists within the business unpacking those stories and journeys, why people want to do what they want to do so that we can enable those journeys. It is also fashionable now to quote big data, which has a place, but which is averaging out situations and missing the nuances, which often tell us a lot about potential areas for change. Perhaps the saddest reflection is that we treat data collection as just another cost item to be slashed to save money. What then should we do with the good data? Well, I think firstly compile insights and get them into the debate. This is way before any conclusions. It's all about creating the narrative. Governments might want to control the modelling to be able to control the stories around the outcomes, the narrative. Stories can be helpful and they don't have to be about the final conclusions. I go back to my early experience. One story I often tell from that modelling process was how hard old bus timetables were to comprehend. Our expert coders struggled and there were four timetables they could not determine where the routes went. So I tell the story to lead to discussion of what technical people are doing now to make information easily available. If the first thing people hear from us is a conclusion or a patronising instruction, then we may be sending an unintentional message of, we've done the work, so shut up and listen. But an insight can be a starting point for engagement. And we must not rush to follow an insight with our own conclusions. Let people ponder on a thought and then listen to their response. A very simple example. So much of the public discussion is still about trips to the CBD. We might know the CBD does not create the majority of trips, but I know of recent examples in the media where this was still presented as the whole story and it skewed the discussion. Should we just quote some numbers? I think we need to consider all powers of language to help. In the mid-90s, I presented a paper at an ARRB conference titled Transport Planning, a Profession in Need of Metaphor. You see, we call the CBD the heart of the city, fed by arterial corridors. In a body, all blood goes to the heart and out again. This is not the case for the transport task. It is more like fish in the ocean, with some reefs attracting a little bit more activity. One reviewer thought it was an inappropriate topic for a technical conference. Now, you might not like my metaphor, so think of something else. Chris Stapledon encourages people to look at traffic on main roads and see how many vehicles are making turns. In other words, not going straight through. Here's another example. At the AITBM National Conference, Sydney Lord Mayor Clover Moore noted that 92% of trips in Sydney CBD during the day are walking. I try to personalise this by quoting the figure and then asking questions such as, so why does a lot of modern architecture not include awnings against the rain and the sun? Transport is not just about capacity. Insights are not just quirky facts. Where does modelling fit into this? Well, looking at scenarios rather than trying to accurately predict the future is a very good start. But it's still a long process. I ponder the possibilities that Professor David Hencher has with his modelling package that incorporates transport, land use, and societal factors. He says that he can get an indicative output from a model run in about 40 minutes. So rather than the define and defend approach, what about a back and forth process with the stakeholders, including the community? But before we start modeling, we should show some insights from our data, including unexpected facts and always ask what other ways could we spend this sort of money. Then we will run some models, even with some left field suggestions. 
and in a short time give some feedback, not in the style of yes it will work or no it won't, not even just these are the projected volumes. We should use results to prompt more discussion. Maybe something like, we don't think the railway will work well enough without a bus feeder system. What sort of bus network would you use? Or, these are the land use changes that could reasonably happen. How should we plan for that? Or David's model can even code in what might happen if we have another COVID situation. So my conclusions. We have to change the nature and timing of our input so we can engage more effectively. We are not just about reaching conclusions. We have to learn how to start conversations rather than seeing our role as ending them.